Hey, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show. It's I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 609. That is 609 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. I hope this podcast is finding you well wherever you may be. I really do. How am I? Thank you for asking. I'm doing pleasantly fine, actually. Not too bad. All things considered, I'm doing okay. And when I mean all things considered, it's what? Sober October. I'm not drinking. I'm not doing any drugs. I'm not really going out. So my, you know, half of my life or the majority of my life, the things I usually get up to on a daily basis, especially on the weekends, has been taken away from me. But the one thing I do like about it, as you've probably noticed, is my consistency with the podcast on, during a week has been pretty crazy. I've been able to drop free. I've done a couple of live streams. I'm probably going to do a patron at the end of the week. And that is all because I'm not going out and I'm not drinking and not getting high. It's funny what that can do, right? It's funny what that can do for your productivity. Um, so that's a really stark reminder, a little bit of a depressing reminder because it means I'm now thinking about all the time that I've wasted, but that's to put that to one side. Let's just continue doing what we're doing right now and hopefully it will get better as we progress and then I'll come to realization that actually maybe I just need to abstain for everything if I actually want to achieve my dreams. That's the actual brutal, honest truth of the matter. If you actually want to achieve something, you actually have to minimize all distractions, especially when you want to achieve things in the spaces that I'm trying to achieve and which are very competitive, um, which are, you know, where the barrier of entry is really low in terms of DJing, in terms of podcasts, in terms of being, you know, a content creator type person. The barrier of entry is low. The competition is flipping deep. So you really have to do a lot to kind of break through the noise and kind of build your own little audience, um, get a little bit ahead of steam and finally be able to quit your day job and be able to say, yes, I finally achieved it. It's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot. But I'm really, really, really willing to roll up my sleeves and to fight for it because why the hell not why the hell not but it is funny though how dead my weekends are when i don't have clubs to go to and of course i'm not djing as much as i would like to so that obviously is not an option either but when i don't have nightclubs to go to it's really interesting how dead my weekends are so it really does need to you know i really need to think about the next couple of weeks which i'm actually going to think about doing which i want to get a flipping skateboard and a football just so i can go to the park and have a little kick about myself or just join a little five-a-side team and then of course the skateboard just kind of muck around on that for a couple of hours a day i'm not the best but i used to skate you know quite often when i was younger but now i kind of you know i haven't skated in many 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 years so i have to basically start from scratch um, but I would like to kind of get that started again because I need to have some sort of hobbies because if you, if you take away clubbing and I have absolutely nothing to do, that's pretty worrying. And I don't want to be one of those people who I kind of cuss in my head when I see them kind of have their whole personality wrapped around techno, wrapped around going to clubs, wrapped around flipping, following DJs. It's really cringe. So I don't want to be that person. So I don't want to be hypocrite and cuss those people while I'm doing exactly the same thing. So I want to have other flipping strings to my bow. I already think I do have them anyway because I read a lot. I watch cool movies and documentaries and stuff i go to art galleries i draw i write and all this kind of stuff but still let's talk about actual hobbies that involve me having to go outdoors i need to have some more of them that don't involve nightclubs because at the moment it's looking kind of bleak for your boy it's looking kind of bleak but that aside it's been decent again you know i can't have anything bad to say about sober october it's always great to kind of wake up clear-headed um it's always great to kind of um you know wake up and not have your bank account absolutely drained it's all good to wake up like that completely and not kind of be regretting your life decision because that's one thing that people don't talk about too often it's the always a day after especially if you've gone off especially if you've gone on like a really crazy binge like i do right it's always the day after or the monday after where you're starting to regret your life decisions you're starting to think raw where could i be if i didn't do this and all this kind of stuff and all this weird self-doubt and regrets start to come into your head even though a few hours before you were having the greatest time in your life you know in your head but then soon after that greatest time flipping feeling ends up kind of subsiding and you end up kind of regretting everything that you did so it's a bit bittersweet when you go out and stuff and get on it and whatever it may be because it's only really good for a very very short period of time unless of course you're involved in it and you're running events and you're DJing and stuff and you're you know I don't know working behind the door working on the door working behind the bar maybe it's a bit different but if you're just a partner like I am it does does kind of it does kind of get boring which is why i'm suspect of people because i know i have like to have fun i know i like to get effed up so that's why i'm i'm always wary of people who like to do it and don't seem like they have a a, a flipping end date 
you know, or they don't have like a flipping pause button. They just love it all the time. It's like, hmm, what are you running away from? Because I know I was running away from something. So you're definitely running away from something. If you're still going at it and you're still enjoying it to that level and you don't see anything wrong with going out all the time, like there's definitely something dodgy going on there. But hey, who am I to judge in it? Who am I to judge? We'll have our things that we do. So quick way to crack on. First topic I'm going to talk about is this um, Supreme and North Face collaboration that just dropped yesterday. And I've saw a few people kind of commenting about it on Supreme sort of Twitter, right? People that comment on like streetwear and sneaker new sort of stuff. And I see there's a segment of people online who are kind of taking pleasure in the fact that a lot of this stuff from the new Supreme collection, right? For Sorry, the new Supreme collaboration with um, North Face that was just kind of released. And you know, look what pictures came out there with um, what's his face? I forgot the kid's face that's flipping modeling it but you guys know him from social media he's always got some crazy cool outfits on and I assume this new direction in terms of models is definitely something maybe that Tremaine was involved in maybe he wasn't maybe he was but I still like the look of it I think everything in it looks really cool um good pants good jackets good bags nothing really to complain about but for some reason people were commenting online and really trying to kick um Supreme and North Face while they're down because for the most part especially during the rest of the or majority of today actually on the majority of when it you know the majority of the day when it actually dropped all of these jackets were basically in stock right they were also i think a couple of them are still in stock yeah like this one here with a pattern with that kind of dragon motif and a few of these are still in stock and whatever maybe let's look at the backpacks are they still in stock or even the pants the pants are still in stock it looks like yeah the pants are still one of the pants is sold out and if we go down to the backpack in this collection um, all the backpacks I imagine will be in will be in stock, right? So yeah. So anyway, people are really kind of you know, kind of reveling in the idea that Supreme has maybe fallen off because one of their North Face collaborations has you know not sold out as probably the way people would expect it to sell out. Now, my initial reaction to this, just as a layman who has no inside information and just pays attention as a fan of this stuff and has been a fan of Supreme for many, 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 many years. Um, it's pretty obvious to see that they all they they have they have basically decided to up the quantities of the amount of items they make every season or maybe every year. It's definitely gone up, and especially nowadays where you'd say Supreme is as mainstream as it's ever been. It's no longer an underground brand. It's no longer a brand that kind of you know you had to kind of buy through proxy through somebody else that lives in the states and stuff. No, it's stuff that everybody knows about. Everybody, including their mum, probably knows about. So if that's the case, and they have also kind of you know started to ramp up the amount of retail stores that they have there's rumors of a store opening up in south korea i've heard rumors of a store opening up in germany another one i've heard another rumor of another store opening up in italy there's another rumor of another one opening up in france so they're clearly starting to ramp things up there's rumors that they're going to relocate the london store to another location maybe that mean they'll have more room to have more stock in who knows but regardless there's clearly an uptick in the amount of stuff that they're making it just is what it is right to satisfy demand in some respect they're still kind of pulling it back so it's not kind of flooding the streets but to make sure that they can supply the demand of all the stores they have to wrap up ramp up the quantities so that clearly means that you know they're going to be more jackets available for people to buy and because there's only a finite number of supreme fans especially Supreme fans that would like to buy a North Face because that's a very particular niche in itself. It does lend itself to realize, okay, cool, maybe not everybody's going to be wanting to run and race to kind of sell in this jacket out because, you know, they've got many other in their collection. And also the other thing I've noticed too, or I'm kind of theorizing or throwing out there, if I'm not mistaken, especially in the winter, don't Supreme put out two North Faces? So there's most likely going to be a Noopsy that's going to come out too, like the classic jacket that we kind of know Supreme for. So if that's the case, they'll have two Supreme collaborations in one season. Of course, that would mean some people might decide, hey, I'm going to wait for that Noopsy to come out instead of buying this jacket or whatever it may be. Or sometimes because now as well, the other thing I just thought about, because I remember I had this theory long time ago that I was theorizing that it felt like Supreme was slowly going the direction of maybe producing their own type of North Face jackets because they were starting to ramp up the amount of, like even you can see here, the amount of down jackets that they had, the amount of quilted jackets that they had, like jackets that you would maybe, you know, um, look at and think, oh, that could be a Supreme, that could be a North Face collaboration. They started to make a lot more of those stuff in-house. And if you remember, or I remember clearly reading loads of old interviews of Supreme with the founder, James Jebby and a few other people attached to it and one of the things they always used to say was that they always wanted to make the best of the best in each category so we're going to 
make the best of the best ourselves and if we can't we're going to go link up with the people who make the best in that each category so if it's like leather jackets vanson if it's like whatever war is laura piano whatever that stuff is right they they kind of go in and align themselves with the best manufacturers of each of those kind of things or producers whatever they may be, or brands and obviously supreme you know north face is a classic sort of collaboration because it's north face ties with new york street culture and whatnot but overall they obviously do make great jackets but it did make I did kind of think to myself like if you're supreme and you do want to you know you do want to kind of keep amping and stuff up you know expanding your reach allowing yourself to kind of make more money maybe sort of get into a point where you start making your own North Face collaborations or be or start making your own North Face type jackets would be something that might make sense because I'd imagine the deal that they have they have to split something whether it's profits or whatever it may be or there's a contract I'm not really sure how it works but if you can kind of you know take away that expense take away having to divvy up that money and just keep it all in house that might actually be um, a sound business decision to go down but we haven't really seen any evidence of it every season more North Face keeps coming out you don't really hear any rumours about you know North Face you know moving away even when Super Prima doing collaborations with Stone Island. I had a feeling, oh, is Stone Island going to replace North Face? But it didn't really. Stone Island was just like another sort of like, you know, a brand partner they sort of work with on special projects and stuff. So clearly there's been some wiggle room around it. But in general, in general, the kind of underlying point is that clearly the quantities and the amount of stuff that they produce has gone up. It just is what it is. So it's no surprise that some stuff is sitting for a bit longer than it was in the past. And there's only a finite amount of fans out there that are like Supreme stuff and also that like, you know, North Face stuff. So it just makes complete sense that it would go that way. But I don't really get this kind of race for everybody to just kind of put out their hot take maybe it's a hot take thing in it because we're living in a flipping hot take society everyone's a fucking hot take mcgee but i don't know this rush that everyone has to kind of be the first person to say supreme is dead it's dead it's dead it's like haven't they proved over their 20 plus history um you know different trends different you know customer bases and whatever it may be world issues that they always find a way to survive and some of the greatest brands do that because they just keep doing what they do and the fans that they like that that like what they do keep buying what they do and it just keeps rolling 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 especially when supreme sighting she introduced you know suiting to their flipping you know array of items they're putting out there there was a clear idea i'd guess in-house that we need to basically be able to provide our customers with a route out of wearing a box logo you know what i mean and that's basically what they've done maybe just by introducing them to other brands and other collaborations or whatever it may be so this idea that they're going to somehow die um anytime soon is really redundant especially when you look at the culture at now at the moment especially when you look at you know how flipping rampant hype these culture is and that hasn't died you know even though i flipping hate that sort of stuff and that seems to be going you know stronger than ever so this rush to be the first person to say it's going to die is a bit weird um, and also kind of attributing you know a slowdown in their impact or reach because you know North Face collaborators are sitting is also dodgy because some of the stuff that sells out on Supreme you know they probably like some of the keychains for instance that North Face keychain went straight away and it was like four pounds how many of those North Face keychains do you think they made 10,000 20,000 and they sold them out instantly in one in a couple of hours or something I remember I kept checking and that and that flipping keychain flew out this keychain here it went completely gaga. It's a pretty innocuous piece of thing. It looks like a bit of fabric um, with a with a flipping jacket sort of like pattern on it with a badge at the bottom that says North Face Supreme and a kind of boring at the top. That's it. Nothing too crazy. And I think it's like six pounds or four pounds or something like that. I'm not too sure. Let's check the price actually. But this sold out instantly. So if stuff like this is ten pounds, stuff like this can sell out instantly, and they probably produced what twenty thousand pieces of this, maybe fifty, maybe a hundred. Then to say that you know, and they sold all those out to say the supreme is finished is crazy because there are people out there who are buying these by the fucking thousands, flipping them, and they're gonna get keep flipped. They're gonna get flipped until the fucking end of time basically so this premise that supreme has done is really really bizarre really really odd i don't really get it but i guess everyone wants to be fucking nostradamus out there in it so you know whatever what bloody ever moving on from that i want to touch upon my favorite topic that i like to kind of you know rant and ramble about Bergheim. so Bergheim have just released their november um, lineup of things that are happening at the club and the first thing that came to mind just from a fan's point of view is that is it me or are the lineups a lot more I wouldn't say underwhelming but they're very they're sort of um they're not very glitzy are they anymore 
And I wonder why that is. Like in terms of big names, in terms of like a variety of names. There's a, there's a variety of names, don't get me wrong, but they're kind of the same type of people you're kind of seeing again and again and again. So clearly it feels like there's been a change in direction in what they're trying to do. That's what it feels like a little bit, maybe in the booking process. Or maybe is it the fact that in a post-pandemic world, some people have just quit DJing. Some people have moved into other, you know, areas of the industry. Um, maybe some people don't have the means to come, you know, and visit or come to play in places like Berlin or travel in general. Maybe some have changed how they do, you know, approach their DJing in general. Maybe said, you know what, I'm just going to do local gigs. If I can't drive, I'm not going to go. Maybe it's that sort of vibe. Um, or maybe it's just this is a, this is kind of the natural evolution of, of clubs like this. Like you just kind of have to keep reinventing yourself. And how they're basically reinventing yourself in this regard is that you see obviously the residents there playing all the time, but you see a lot of sort of like family and friends that you'd kind of maybe associate with Berka and also playing um, considerable in these lineups. But, you know, the times when I, you know, randomly went to Berka and then saw fucking DJ Harvey playing, it feels like that's long gone. Do you know what I mean? The, I think the closest I saw to that was maybe recently, maybe a couple of years ago, maybe it was 2020. I remember there was a lineup where Solomon was playing in Berghain randomly. No, I think it was maybe Panorama Bar, actually. It wasn't Berghain, it was Panorama Bar, yeah. Solomon played there in 2020, I think, or 2021. So that's the last time I've seen like a quote-unquote big name that you would describe, or, you know, someone you maybe see on DJ Mag or Mix Mag and shit who's going to definitely sell a lot of tickets or who's going to, you know, may, maybe bring a big crowd down to the place. And I'm not sure what is the right thing because i think overall if you've if you've gone to berkheim uh post pandemic or post lockdown sorry you would have definitely recognized that it's not as full as it once was ever and there are some nights where it does get really busy especially there are some periods of the nights where it does get really really rammed but how it was prior where it was just like a constant heaving throbbing group of people just coming in and out in and out it's not like that at all anymore it's definitely way more um sparse you you know it's for the first time in a long time i remember i mentioned this beforehand but when i used to go prior i never even knew what the dj booth looked like most of the time because i was flipping off my head and whatnot but because it was so rammed you didn't even get a chance to go through to the front so i was just near the especially the burger on floor I was always kind of dancing on the platforms or standing towards next to the speakers on the right hand side and stuff around the back but I never got a chance to go near the front and one time when I went just before the pandemic I remember just being like wow man like I actually got to see what the booth looks like because I, I got to see right through it from the back I got to see straight through up to the front of the booth and I was like shit I've never actually seen what the booth actually looks like like not even you know inside just for the front and that was basically a big sign that maybe the kind of the amount of people that go have basically decreased and that obviously is my ongoing theory that most of it has to do with the fact that you know general punters have basically moved on and i guess we all took that we all took them for granted whether you're a promoter whether you're an event booker you took that kind of customer who just you know um on a whim decides to go to a nightclub because they basically add to the overall numbers you know you got the club kids you got the djs you got the scenesters and stuff but then you need the general punter person to just kind of fill out places and kind of get you ticking over sell out a couple of your dates bloody blah 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 and that obviously hasn't happened so i wonder if this is a reaction to this and Berger like you know what because we don't have general punters coming in there's no need to book all these kind of like general dj mag mix mag type djs let's just book people that we actually want to see play like interesting people um maybe lineups that probably wouldn't sell um you know traditionally well maybe pre-pandemic in like 2018 or 2017 to 2019 and let's kind of go for it and actually try and change things because that's why i think they've done really well quietly you know, there's a whole conversation uh, prior to the lockdown about there not being a lot of rep female representation, not a lot of black and brown people playing in certain parties, certain raves, not a lot of maybe queer people, LGBTQ plus people. And I feel like Burkhan in, as general, as a sort of like leading force in dance music, especially in club culture, have just done it very quietly by just, you know, changing the lineups and just having them be, you know, loads of more, loads of label type takeovers collective takeovers loads of just loads of just different people that you wouldn't necessarily see having a chance to play at a place like Berghain um, one being obviously Lily Ackerman and uh, big up her having a chance to play there that's absolutely amazing and loads of other people also that are getting a chance to play there so it's pretty decent to see that way but I am it's just it was kind of 
curious to me when I saw the lineup. I was like, huh, it is. It's both underwhelming and also quite inspiring that this lineups exist in a place like this, because it clearly means that there's somebody that works there or is associated with that's got the, that's got their finger on a pulse that's kind of plugged in or that's got somebody that kind of does that for them, because they always seem to kind of book the the right people, the right mix, um, right representation, all that sort of stuff. It kind of gets tick 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 ticked. So clearly there's something going on there that's really good. And one of the nights I was kind of looking at thinking, you know what, I could do a little quick weekender and just quickly nip over there and nip back again was this weekend. This one here. This is what I was looking at. So it's the Friday the 11th, Friday the 18th of November. Um, and then that'll probably end up me leaving on the Friday and then coming back on the following Monday. But that's the kind of thing that I'm kind of looking at to kind of check out. And obviously if I do end up going, I'm definitely going to make sure I check out flipping RSO. Um, I still haven't blood, bloody gone. I think I'm mentioning it to somebody else. One of the annoying things about going to this place is that because it's always got such a great, you know, expansive list of people that are playing it's really difficult to kind of go somewhere else you kind of get stuck there and you just want to enjoy your party there and not go to another venue especially because the other venues are usually all over the city because unlike london they don't have clubs just in one area because i feel like for us if whatever reason we have clubs in just like what they're kind of clustered they're all, all in east in one area all in south one area da, 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 da. but i guess because they have such great you know relationships with the local council and shit and they're allowed to open super late it, there's no need to have a club in a certain area you can just have it anywhere and it's still going to close at 6 a.m anyway or whatever it's going to close at 8 a.m it doesn't really matter so that kind of is a good thing but obviously for a partner like myself who's kind of you know i kind of get stuck um i kind of get par par what was it paralysis of analysis oh yeah analysis paralysis where you're just overthinking where you should go and then you don't make a decision and you just end up just staying in Birkenham the whole time and then you end up complaining about it and making a video about it <laughs> so i'm gonna mix up if i do end up going i'll probably end up going to some different places like i said rso is a one place to go and of course same heads is also a different place to go to but these lineups on the Friday the 18th is really nice too. You've got Finest Fridays, you've got um, a Stack, Shka, Shka, Shka track. Alin Kerr, Itella Johnson, and Mary Moxamia, who I actually saw play at Fabric for the first, first time in real life. And she was really good. And then I saw her play again. Where was it? Oh, shite. I forgot where it was again in London, but I've seen that a couple of times and I've always been impressed. And of course, I tell her Johnson, I've got a ton of their tracks on my USBs that I play out when I did DJ a lot. And I'm a big fan of their production, so I'm sure they'll be decent DJs, but I've never actually seen them play before. So that's obviously really cool. And obviously, Alinka is really amazing too for the clip see people upload on online. She's always playing some really cool disco y type. Um, you know i tell a vibe type stuff so that's probably something i'm gonna end up checking out as well and then the a the 19th date is a big one this is a big one this is because you got a little bit you got a couple of uh malahunta um djs here representing you know d, d dan dj tall hyper activists and shit so that's going to be a pretty decent one that list is an absolute meaty one and i'd imagine that might end up being the most busiest weekend of the absolute of november in the first place burger and you got ben clock d dan dj tall et up kyle hyped activist norman nodge jesus and then the panorama bar you got kink aka ozo Jenny on Earth, Lakuti, Massimiliano Pellegrini, Pellegrini, sorry, Nicola Cruz, uh, Paramida, and Sedef Adasi. That's going to be an absolute barnstorm of a night. So I'm probably going to end up booking it anyway. And um, now I'm kind of look reading over it. I'm kind of, you know, getting excited. I've got a little chub going on. So I'm definitely going to end up doing this and making it work. But yeah pretty decent lineups um yeah both underwhelming and also inspiring because for someone like myself who eventually wants to end up playing there it's nice to see that they've got people playing there who are not the biggest baitest names but who are gonna bring the absolute carnage when they end up playing so that's really cool to see and then i guess the following weeks what have you got uh, anything else that stops stands out there of course nick hobner will be absolutely amazing to see in panorama bar on the following weekend you've got boris dvs1 or Bo i've never actually seen boris play no, I did actually, didn't I? I did. What, what am I lying about? I did. I saw him play when I went on July for the Club Sylvester when they kind of did, did the made up Club Sylvester to make up for the one that they didn't do in January, December, January of last year. And I went to one in June, July this year. So I see, I saw him play, but I want to see actually him in his actual element from start to finish. I think I only caught the, the end of it or something. Um, 
So that's pretty decent. And the Paramount Brothers have got Chris Cruz, someone I'm a big fan of. Eris Dio, I'm a big fan of also. Middle, I'm a big fan of. And of course, Roy Perez, I'm a big fan of, especially after seeing him that first time with Dr. Rubenstein back in the day at Mixed Garage. You know, I've kind of been in love with these sets and how he plays for a long time since then. So that should be decent as well. But yeah, that 18th and 19th weekend is looking at something that I might have to end up checking out just for the sake of it. Why bloody not? Why bloody not? And then moving on, I want to quickly touch upon this. This is a topic someone posted in the actual Berlin community subreddit, which I do recommend if you're not a member already, please do check it out. If you have any questions about Berlin stuff and you want to, you know, get kind of some help about outfits and about where to go and all that sort of malarkey, I definitely recommend that you should check out the Berlin um the Berlin community subreddit. It's definitely one of the better ones in my opinion, right? And it's this one here. I'm going to get this up on the screen, just going to wiggle my username. But yeah, that's basically it, right? That one there. And obviously the question here um, regarding, which I kind of found was really interesting, was like this, controversial opinion. Bergheim is not worth a three to six hour wait. Um, and the text follows, it says, if you wait in a queue for this and don't get rejected, you can guarantee you are wasting, um, sorry, you are waiting long also on toilets and drinks. Um, and the dance floor will be packed by 8 p.m. And the mood will reflect this. Bergheim is best when it's way more chill. Nah, I disagree. I've had times there, like I said, that time I went to see DJ Harvey play in the main floor at Berghain, the dance floor, I've never seen it more full. It was legitimately insanely full. I, I literally saw but DJ Harvey's hands and head come up at the end and he kind of clapped the crowd. But I, apart from that, it was just rammed. He couldn't even move. And it was amazing. One of the best nights I've ever had in my life. So the idea that it's only good when it's chill is really ridiculous. Maybe if you're a local, or sorry, if you're a regular and you actually live there, maybe it's different because you don't, you don't actually like the crowd and it being full of tourists but for myself i love it but in general just this idea about waiting i may be a bit biased in this because obviously um i grew up being a sneakerhead i grew up you know collecting and buying you know rare streetwear bits and bobs and whatnot and that whole entire subculture basically was built on queuing right you always had to queue for things even if there weren't that many people buying it there were maybe only 500 of you in the flipping country that liked that kind of stuff you ended up having to queue because there was never enough flipping supply to satisfy demand so just kind of what it was and i guess because of that it kind of taught me a very valuable thing right to be patient to be patient and to also understand like sometimes the things that you really want you kind of have to maybe queue up for them so i've never really had a problem queuing up for things i think there are things clearly that you maybe shouldn't waste your time queuing but i think in general this kind of idea that you're wasting your time queuing considering how much time we all waste on our phone we always talking to people we always browsing around we always just doing absolute nonsense because you have to stand dead you have to stand in a dedicated spot or in a dedicated area for a prolonged period of time with no real guarantee that what you're doing is going to lead to the you know a beneficial outcome i feel like sometimes i think you know it kind of is proof of how um indulge we are in society in general and how lacking we are in the ability to just kind of sit still and just wait for your turn and um, whether or not you get in and out and the thing is really confusing about that post especially when it comes to Berghain it's in Berlin right if this was if that club was in any other country in the world it would make more sense why people would be really pissed off about having to wait so long but Berghain legitimately even if you walk 10 minutes away from the club, there's a literal nightclub you can go to. Maybe not the best, and maybe it doesn't, you know, hold a candle to Bergheim, but there's literally, uh, you know, hundreds of options within five miles of that club that you can get to easily. There's a taxi rank right outside. You can jump into a taxi and maybe just ask the driver. Even if you're lucky, you can ask the driver if he speaks English. Hey, where's the nearest club I can go to that you would recommend? He'll take you there, drop you. Like, it, there's many of options. So this idea that you're wasting your time isn't necessarily true because you can go to a different club straight away anytime of the day that you're actually in that queue um with the exception of maybe i don't know monday morning but basically any time that you leave that queue you can basically go to another nightclub which you can't do in any other city because if you do go somewhere else that place might be closed and hasn't really opened yet blah 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 but that always happens as well and the other thing also that i think is good is that we're all going through the same thing it's not as if you don't have to wait in the queue when you're on the guest list the only people who get bumped to the front are maybe actual regulars who are you know legitimately tied to the club and with like friends and family or friends of, of the or the actual dj themselves but everybody has to wait in the queue at some point you might not you know maybe just guess this queue is shorter than the normal queue but you still have to wait in the queue and i think that's um 
kind of comforting for the most part because you're all kind of in this together and you also under the you also under the premise or the idea that most likely inside you're going to have a really great time so maybe it's worth queuing that time but i think in general you just have to decide for yourself because i'm a i'm a big believer in like you always make time for the things that you actually want to do so this idea that i don't have time to do, I don't have time to do that it's always a bit of a misnomer for me because if you really wanted to do it you would make the time you would carve out the time you'd wake up earlier you stay up later whatever it would do whatever needed to be done in order to get that in order to enjoy the thing that you want to do you would always do it so this idea that queuing is not worth it it means maybe the subtext of it is like maybe you're not really into it anymore it's maybe your subconscious telling you hey go and grab pick up a guitar go and read a book go travel go start bouldering or something maybe that's your subconscious talking to you that hey this is not for you anymore but i don't think it's a waste of time at all in my opinion i think we waste you know i know myself i waste enough time on my phone i waste enough time on social media i waste enough time not doing the things i should be doing i know you know, through various periods of my life when I did sit down, you know, a good example being flipping college or school and stuff. The moment, you know, I was a pretty bad student, but I was always really smart. And in the moment I got really bad results and I had to actually revise because I was worried I wasn't going to get into college. If I had those bad results I took with a test exam, I actually spent like a couple of months actually revising. It was frightening how much I was able to flip and improve. I went from having like, you know, test scores of like E's and F's to suddenly sitting in the real exams and having like A's and B's just from two weeks of actually focusing and revising for real. And the first thing that came to mind when I got the results was like, bloody yo, imagine where I would have been if I just would have focused the whole entire year like that, right? But I was wasting my time doing other things, wasting my time doing everything but revising. So we all waste our time in certain ways. So if you come to adulthood and you finally get to a point where you're, you know, you're into clubs and stuff and you stumble across Burkhine and they tell you, hey, you might have to wait six hours to get into this amazing, you know, mind melding, um, life altering nightclub. It might be worth the six hour wait just to see what it's going to be like in, in the inside, just for the possibility. Like I say before, I'm a big fan of actually seeing and feeling and touching things for myself. I want to see it for myself. So having the ability or have, knowing deep down that maybe if I wait, I might have the opportunity to see that for myself is something that I would never turn down, not in the slightest. So it's definitely worth it for me. But if other people, I understand why it would not be worth it. And also, again, like I said, I'm not the best person to talk about it because I come from a scene where I was always queuing for stuff, trainers, clothes, hoodies, jackets, whatever, right? All the time. Um, and also I'm somebody who at the boom, I don't know if you guys had the same thing, but we had this like, you know, there was a period in time where flipping food trucks were all over the place and people were bringing over their recipes or having to cook the perfect cheeseburger. And this place called uh, Meat Liquor had their food truck when it first started. And me and my friend used to flipping follow that food truck all around London. It'd be parked up outside of flipping, you know, pubs and stuff, parked in pub gardens, um, at flipping food shows, at market things. And they'd kind of announce it on their Twitter, I think, or on their Facebook and you have to go there really early and guess what queue you'd have to queue for the privilege of buying a burger and sometimes it got so bad it wouldn't let you buy more than one you had to buy one only one per person burger like you're copying a fucking box logo hoodie it was absolutely ridiculous and we did that all the time we had a whale of time we got to eat this really nice burger you know with this great meat patty and that was cooked a certain way from this person that clearly had a big passion for it we got to meet other people in the community of cheese burger eating who fucking loved it it was all good i never you know i didn't think that was a waste of time i didn't regret that in the slightest so you know um queuing is what you make it you know it's worth it to you if it's worth it to you really that's the long and short of it that's the long and short of it next well if we could touch upon this this is an interesting article that i saw on essence the premier um you know retailer that stocks all these amazing designer brands that i'm obviously super into like rick owens balenciaga random identities and other 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 brands out there and they've got this really cool editorial section where they do you know editorials and features and stuff on people interviews and whatnot and they had this really cool one that kind of pulled at my heartstrings and also was quite sobering and maybe reflecting a few things in my own life because 
I realized when I was watching this or reading this or scanning through this that as much as I thought this was cute, which is it's called Hey Young World, and its subtext is um, four artistic families at home in London, photographed by Siru Ma and styled by Marika uh, Ella Ames. It says home is where real life takes place. The dirty dishes, the piles of laundry, the laptop left in the unmade bed, toys strewn across the floor, spilled milk and scattered Cheerios on the countertop. The messiness of a living space is intimate, a snapshot of each family accumulating in little piles that build up over a course of a day. So essentially what they're doing is that they're featuring all these really cool, um, hip and trendy couples who are kind of essence adjacent. Maybe they work in fashion, maybe they work in other creative industries and they're basically showing them in their kind of natural habitat how they live um, in their homes with their kids, with their pets, with their partners, wherever it may be. And the first thing that came to mind when I looked at it, I was like, oh, this is so cute. Look at the little baby, you know, with little chubby cheeks, little chubby legs, right? With this cute little family, right? It's amazing. Cute couple, cute family, whatever it may be. But the first thing that came to mind for me was this is not really in my purview in the slightest, especially when I scanned down and I realized that there was a couple of people in here who I know and who are like, I wouldn't say much younger than me, but a few years younger than me who have kind of settled down and just basically decided to kind of have a family. And I think to myself, if they're able to do this at this stage, it's clear that this is something that was always destined for them, always something that they kind of saw in their kind of purview. But for me, I don't see it in the slightest. I really don't. And I don't really have any real desire to start a family anytime soon either. It's not something I've ever kind of really thought about. And I think it might end up really kind of negatively affecting me when it comes to dating, when it comes to having a relationship, when it when it comes to maintaining a relationship, whatever it may be, it really might end up being a really big issue because I'm at the stage now, especially my age, where most likely the people that I meet won't necessarily be into just having a good time and hanging out and just dating or being kind of loose and open and stuff. They're going to probably want to be like, hey, where is this going? Of course, there's going to be people that I'll meet that will kind of be on the same vibe as me, I'm pretty sure, in the future or whenever. But for the most part, everyone which I will kind of come across with will be on that time of like, hey, you know, what's the deal? Where are we going with this? Do you want to do X, Y, and Z? Start a family, whatever it may be. And I'm going to have to be pretty honest and say, nah, like this does nothing for me. Don't get me wrong, it's cute. It's amazing. These couples all look amazing. The kids look fucking beautiful. The homes look gorgeous, you know, loving families and whatnot. But I just don't see this in my kind of future at all. And it's really odd because I think for the longest time, I kind of did see, if I didn't see myself getting married, I did definitely did see myself having a kid first because obviously that can happen a lot easier than getting married, right? You only need to flip in, not wear a flipping, you know, not, not wear a jacket once and then suddenly things can change very quickly. But I, I kind of saw that being something that I can kind of view in my future than getting married. But now I can't see either thing happening anytime soon at all. And I don't really have a desire for it at all. Do you know what I mean? You know how some guys are like, oh yeah, I can't wait to have a son so I can flip in, have him flip in, come to me to watch flipping United games or to kind of go to the park or whatever maybe. I don't care in the slightest. It's not something that has ever crossed my mind um, in one bit whatsoever. And I think that might be a bad thing. Um, and I'm not too sure if it's something because I'm not necessarily where I need to be in life in terms of my career. Maybe that's why I'm kind of, you know, because I'm quite, I'm quite, what's that word called? I'm quite I'm methodical about stuff, right? I like to kind of tick stuff off. I'm the kind of person that eats their chips first, then their burger, then whatever, do you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. So maybe with that kind of tick off mind thing, I'm like, hold on, until I get my career in line, I'm not even going to think about that sort of stuff because what's the point? Um, but maybe I should be thinking about it in parallel. But then when I do think about it in parallel, I don't have any desire for it whatsoever. It doesn't It doesn't really kind of, um, it doesn't pull at me in the slightest. I'm more kind of pulled and sort of like, you know, impress or sort of like envious career-wise when I see people doing the things that I want to do, right? Um, flying around the world, playing in different clubs, you know, you know, sustaining themselves over making content off of YouTube, you know, driving great cars, going on nice holidays, going to the cool places. That sort of stuff is something I'm like, oh, wow, I wish I could do that. I can't wait for me to do that when I finally get to that stage. But when I see stuff like this, I'm like, cool for you, good for you, I'm happy for you, but I don't necessarily see it in my line of sight which is, again, like I said, 
maybe something I kind of need to think about a bit deeply because it might end up putting me in trouble especially now given my current situation it might be something that I kind of need to address pretty pretty quickly um all things considered but yeah man regardless anyway of my own kind of you know in in a monologue in my own kind of um realizations i do recommend you check it out because it is a real beautiful feature um i'm sure just off just watching looking at these pictures you can get some ideas on things that you will do in your home in terms of some home furnishing and whatnot and some interior design little notes and whatnot but it's just a really cool feature to check out i really do recommend that you um give it a little look and just check out some of essence or of editorial pieces also um because you know they did a good job in trying of pulling at my heartstrings and getting me to contemplate my life decisions so yeah definitely check it out i'll put the link in the description but it's called hey young world it's on essence if you just type in hey young world editorial essence you would definitely find it on google and whatnot but definitely check it out if you haven't already definitely check it out if you haven't already then i went to talk about this topic or this article on vice that really does touch upon the things that i've been speaking about in terms of uh, sober october and in terms of the realizations that i've had prior to sober october because to be fair i've been sober before sober october what for like three weeks so i'm, I'm i've been you know i've been doing this for a while it's not like i'm on it or getting drunk or getting high all the time it's just that when i do do it i go extra extra hard but i've kind of done the whole sobriety thing for a long time i think the longest i've basically done it without touching anything was maybe six months but i do kind of do little spurts and starts here and there but in the year but one thing that really has saved me i think over this time in general of my kind of nightlife sort of um period of my life has been that for whatever reason i've never really been the biggest drinker in terms of like enjoying alcohol like i never really have like a, i don't have a bar at home i don't really have booze in my house in general it's stuff i have to kind of go out to go and get um or if i'm on the way home maybe i might grab a, a tin or something but i don't have like stuff that i can maybe drink at home and i think that's always kind of saved me for whatever reason and i don't know why actually i don't actually buy it stuff like that at home because I, I enjoy it when i do buy it when i go out but i never really bother to buy it to kind of bring home and stuff but also what i've realized going out is that for whatever reason i do sometimes get i have it like as a crux maybe because i want something in my hand i don't know what it is but i'm always kind of like grabbing a drink which of course can lead to me kind of you know blowing a bunch of money and also having really horrible hangovers the next day and the one thing that i realized over the last few months and stuff especially with me going to berlin and stuff and going there relatively sober and talking to a lot of people out there that's the first place where i kind of saw people who went out on mass to really because some people that go out here sober but you're going to like gigs and stuff and maybe chill out things that's not too crazy but they're going out to like forest raves and all day raves all weekend raves and some of them are going there completely sober from alcohol or other way around maybe not just doing the drugs and not or maybe just doing the booze and not doing the drugs or whatever it may be but not mixing but they're very strict about it and that's when I first sort of like opened my eyes to it. I was like, you know what, maybe I might give this a try. And then when I got back to London, I did decide to go out a few times without the booze and maybe did a couple of drugs and stuff. And it was a far better experience, especially the next day. The next day was brilliant. You didn't have such a because you can only imagine what the hangovers would be when you're doing like class safe substances and you're also drinking so to take out one part of that experience does make the hangovers far better especially if you start to get older it's just something that you'd kind of have to just kind of you know um reconcile with and the alcohol um usage or the alcohol drinking for me at the most part i felt like was turning into a bit of a crux as well so i went to kind of get that under control and i know for sure because i've been out plenty of times completely sober on of everything that it's not something that i need to have in order to have a good time i'm just doing it because i'm just there so when i took alcohol out of the equation wow 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 it changed everything and this article here um from vice basically expands in a little bit and kind of gives a reason as to why this has become a thing um especially with the gen z generation and whatnot so this is courtesy of vice it says how alcohol losses call a further pub visits are now alcohol free but drinking has been losing its street cred in popular culture for a while now and this is by an editor called daisy jones it says if you're over 25 you probably remember the very catchy and silly opening lines of kesha's song tiktok released in 2009 the song was everywhere on radios and soundtracks um this was also the era of skins a tv show that announced itself with an advert of teens looking fucked up off their face um vomiting on each other it was a time when you couldn't open a page of enemy without a 
counteracting an ex-libertine swigging from an old pirate looking bottle of rum and someone from electro crash band glittering jing jeggings yeah jugging uh glugging straight clampers and when rihanna rounded off the decade by releasing cheers i'll drink to that in 2010 most of us for everyone has spent the year doing just that but over the 10 years that's passed and look around you booze is all but dried out according to a 2002 survey from drink aware 20 per six 20 per six 26 percent of 16 to 24 year olds in the uk are now fully total that is nuts that is nuts that is nuts to think about that mate 26 percent these kids are like kind of boring isn't it um in august a report from cam and lucky saint found that almost a third of all pub visits are now alcohol free this isn't a new or sudden shift either the non-alcoholic beverages market has grown over 360 percent since 2015 and google searches for sober curious peaked in 2021 following the pandemic stories about gen z and even millennials becoming sick of drinking have been barely after the new cycle we could sit and spend hours theorizing why especially younger people in the uk aren't mainlining uh, booze they don't have time for hangovers because their free time um because their free moment has to be funneled into two or three hustles they prefer being online they're anxious about climate change but ultimately many of these theories seem to be overlooked one major factor which is that alcohol simply isn't cool anymore ketamine weed and mushrooms are doing just fine apparently but alcohol is an undergone a pr crisis once you notice it's inescapable at the time of writing not a single you know what actually let me talk about that the PR crisis is actually true because, like I said, I remember a time when I was going out, especially around the Dawson time, right? The Shoreditch times, the Dawson times, the kind of, you know, that kind of peak um, when that stuff was popping up. It was kind of like a, what's that, a badge of honour, but you felt like you were like the boy. You felt like you were the guy. You felt like you were him when you jumped off of the fucking train at Liverpool Street Station and had a bevy in hand and you're fucking walking down the street, walking up to Shoreditch, maybe heading up to Kingston Road or whatnot and swigging on your case cider, swigging on your fucking Cronenberg, swigging on your red stripe, whatever you had in your hand or even your bottle of flipping horrible wine or Prosecco, you felt like an absolute boss and people kind of looked at you like, oh yeah, he's ready to party. But nowadays you don't really see many people carrying open tins of like alcohol in the streets just like swigging it in general and if you do see someone with it you maybe kind of think they're a bit of a crackhead strange isn't it how this happened it's really changed very quickly especially in london because you know no you know it's not i, I don't know if it's actually legal to drink on the streets i don't think it technically is but no one really gives a fuck but for the most part like i said in cool trendy areas you don't necessarily see a lot of people outside just drinking on the streets or just hanging out or drinking on the way to go to somewhere like kind of what we used to do which is basically just pre-gaming as you're going on the way to the place you don't see that at all to be honest um once you notice it's unescapable at the time of writing not a single track in the uk top 10 um, mentions getting fucked up which is really interesting um it continues um i wanted to speak to some other people about the shift in drinking culture the guy behind secret drug addict anonymous twitter account for his frank post about drugs alcohol and that at the height of brit pop agrees of the actions of change he's been sober since 2007 but since the best part of the 90s and, uh, and the thousands working with record labels he says i think drinking has been celebrated back then was quite celebrated back then, sorry. It was rock and roll. Over the years, people's attitudes towards excessive drinking have changed slightly. Back then, if somebody got into an absolute state, it would be like, oh, they're a lightweight. They wouldn't, um, they wouldn't, he says, immediately be concerned. Everyone is a lot more clued up about mental health and stuff these days. That's very true. I think if people did see you getting, I think in most places, unless you go somewhere where people just don't give a fuck, I think in most places, if you was to go to a bar and just start getting yourself sloshed at the bar, just ordering round after round after round, I think either the bartender will probably kind of, you know, tell you to chill or somebody would come up to you and ask you if you're okay. People are a lot more clued into knowing and recognizing when somebody's drinking for fun or drinking to kind of drown their sorrows um but i'm also thinking about when i grew up there was a time when you know i was drinking a lot and stuff and my instagram feed was just me out drinking it would just be pictures of my of my pints pictures of me holding a drink going out pictures of me making a funny face of a drink like it would always be like drink banter and now i can't ever picture myself doing such a thing it feels so naff it feels so childish to do something like that but that was a thing i used to do a lot back then um, and you can imagine how bad it would have been if I had Instagram stories then, right? I'd just be uploading a thousand stories of me fucking ordering drinks and whatnot. 
He continues, um, he rules off other reasons. No one likes to do the same drugs as their parents did. So there's that element. Also the price of it, he says. So I go out and get a round in and it's 40 pound. Very true. Also the music industry now is dependent on the live shows because the records don't sell. They spend most of their life on the road. They can't drink they like they used to. So musicians are healthier. And if you're young and musicians are you're not, you're into on picture drinking it's not aspirational that's very true there's not a lot of really rock star musicians especially outside of hip-hop there's not a lot of musicians who are really on it some of them kind of larp like they're crackheads or that they're into drugs but for the most part they're all pretty clean do you know what i mean it's like the it's like the it's like the future thing. Future talks about lean all the time, but that guy makes too much good music and puts together too many cohesive albums for him to be flipping, you know, monged out on lean or coke or whatnot. It just doesn't make any sense. Tom Nelson, thirty one, says he remembers alcohol being a kind of an omnipresent force in pop culture throughout his teens and early twenties. He says a lot of pop culture at the time was really focused on drinking culture. There was a huge focus on celebrities leaving clubs drunk, drunk behavior being seen as entertaining on reality TV. And I feel like even every song on the, at the time was about getting trash and how fun it was to be drunk. So what changed? Rachel Lee and insights and culture analysis, digital fairy, a creative agency specializing in youth culture, thinks the reasons for been drinking and losing his edge are nuanced 10 or 15 years ago many of us didn't fully grasp the pick of us vomiting a case side into the bush might remain online forever true that's not the case anymore being brought up on the internet where young people are highly vigilant of the risk of their drunken behavior being filmed and permanently embedded on social media which probably means why a lot of people have finsters i follow a couple of people on telegram who have like their little telegram account where they post all their nonsense that only certain people have access to and whatnot so clearly there's been a kind of cleanup of people's image online that people are kind of aware of um, there are other reasons too she says like the mainstreaming of health anxiety young generations witnessed her lived through their rise and fall of wellness in the past decade and lee adds on one hand the nuanced understanding of health underpins a desire to avoid both physical and mental risk of drinking but on the other hand their most formative and prim and pre or per permitted to party coming of age years were crashed by or erased sorry, by a global e uh, economic pandemic and some of them just want to let loose um likely Nils also thinks social media has also the trajectory of how we view alcohol today uh, they said i think social media creating this need to be perfect has taken away from the carefree vibe of the 2010s uh, where people would upload 100 facebook photos from a night out exactly me included and everyone would look like they would be in a two-week bender if kim Kardashian was photographed in the same way lindsey lohan was for people would be so shocked now but it was normal for us which i definitely agree i'm not going to read the entire thing you can check out yourself but it's a really good article really reckon you check it out um and kind of speaks to the position that I'm in at the moment where for the most part, even after sober October, the drinking is definitely going to be knocked on the head for the most part, especially when I go out, the drinking is done. Um, I much prefer to just get on it with the drugs and stuff if I am going to go out uh, or maybe just have a one flipping drink at home to kind of line the stomach. But the kind of excessive buying of like booze at the bar is none. And I've noticed also if like, I've noticed how much nicer bartenders are intentive they are when you're sober, because I guess they realize you are sober and they can kind of clock it straight away and they're extra nice sometimes. They might even give you a free can of coke or whatnot if you kind of keep ordering them at the bar which i usually do because i want to have some bubbles or some sensation in my mouth when i'm partying and whatnot so that's definitely a way to go going forward and obviously like i said um you know you look you look less sloppy as well when you're out doing that kind of stuff but hey what do i know talk about going out and whatnot and stuff that i want to do <clears throat> i had the feeling or i had the thinking when i saw this in my inbox that this might end up being the perfect the perfect, 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 perfect DJ bag. And I want to know if you guys agree or if you think I'm being bougie. So this is via the Balenciaga website. And the bag that I'm talking about is the Le Cago, the medium tote bag and also the messenger bag. Maybe not this excess flat bag that this kid's got on in the campaign picture or the model's got on there. Maybe it's a bit too small for a pair of headphones and a couple of USB sticks or whatnot and some chapstick. But I think these two bags here are definitely ones that would definitely kind of look really cool if you're a DJ coming up. Now, the price tag is pretty crazy. 1,890 and the messenger bag is 1,690. But I do like the look of them. I really do. Especially considering they've kind of got a 
Y2K-ish feel to them. I hate to use that term again because everyone's kind of ramping it up and whatever it may be, but they do have that kind of vibe to them. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this La Cago bag is based on the kind of iconic Balenciaga bag that flipping, of all people, Nicholas Gesker de, de Stein, who, you know, for now, I don't know what's happened to him as a designer. I think I've kind of spoken about it on, on flipping Twitter a couple of times. I don't really know how somebody can go from being so talented like Nicholas Gesker was during his time at flipping Balenciaga. And now he's at Louis Vuitton Women's and the stuff that he's putting out there is demonstrably terrible. But um, this bag is based on the, um, oh, what was it called? I forgot the name of the bag, but he designed a bag uh, at Balenciaga that had the similar kind of bits of hardware with these little studs and whatever it looked like. And I guess what Demna did at Balenciaga was that he kind of reinterpreted it or you know, remixed it kind of in a way, right? Cut it up, extended it, patched it up and whatnot and made it into its own little kind of um, Frankenstein effect type bag that you see here now today. Um, and it looks fucking amazing. So this messenger kind of flat bag is also really cool i feel like it would kind of lend itself really well to kind of being a dj bag that you could fit again headphones like i got on now these sennheisers or maybe my phonons oh yeah and it's quite wide as well so there's a lot of kind of room in that bag to fit a lot of stuff in and the strap is really long as well so you kind of fling it over your shoulder or fling it cross body and it can look like a regular sort of messenger bag it won't look too handbaggy um <clears throat> And it's obviously got nice compartments everywhere that you can use. The inside of it is fairly big also to use in terms of compartments, as you can see there. But the only thing that I'm kind of doubting is that if you've, if you've kind of DJed or if you've been out clubbing before, you would know it gets very messy very, very quickly. So I'm just thinking if you were to go out with a bag that's nearly worth two grand, to carry your DJ equipment in and one day you just get too fucked up and you forget it there or something or it gets nicked, you would cry so badly. I mean, I know I would. I'd be crying so, so hard. But I also think maybe the, because the fact that it's so expensive, it might actually lend to you actually looking after a lot more than you would if it wasn't expensive. Maybe that's a situation I also have to bear in mind. But I wonder if this is a thing that you would see a lot more coming up because when I did browse earlier YouTube, to check some DJ videos and stuff, I stumbled across the video channel, um, Luca something, right? The guy that does loads of videos for tech house type people or like business techno type people, right? All the kind of big, big names like the Jamie, sorry, the Seth Truxlers, the Michael Bibbies, the Ricardo Villalobos's, the Rareshes, all those kind of really big dudes. Um, and what I did see that was kind of fairly evident, they don't really see a lot because, you know, I, I listened to quite a lot of, dance music that covers different sort of things i go to you know techno nights i go to disco nights i go to house nights and one thing that's very specific to tech house djs is the amount of designer clothes you see or labels you see behind the booth especially obvious stuff i'm pretty sure techno guys do it too but they may be a little bit more subtle but the obvious brand i saw behind the booth was really interesting like the heron prestons the balenciagas the off-whites the louis vuittons alexander mcqueen i saw some people wearing gucci i saw a lot more labels than i've ever seen in my entire life behind that DJ booth and I was wondering would it be something because Balenciaga's got that weird vibe where it's sort of like a club kids brand too because of the heritage of the brand with them starting Vetemont Vetemont being very tied to kind of street culture and you know creatives and avant-garde and whatever else it may be and then it kind of extended onto Balenciaga, even though the price point is incredibly high, right? You'd have to be a real freak to buy a 600 pound t-shirt from Balenciaga and then go and sweat in it in a burger and whatnot. But there is that kind of weird crossover that exists with people that buy it. So I wonder if this would be a bag that would appeal to the more traditional, dark, gloomy, moody techno DJs, or would this be something that would appeal to the tech housey guys who like to whistle and shit and, you know, where, you know, have like funky colored hair and, you know, have girls that look like they come out of Love Island standing behind them in a booth. I wonder if that's a thing. I really, really do wonder, but both bags are pretty sick. I probably, if I had to have to go, maybe go for the messenger flap in terms of my needs, even though this medium tote bag is really nice. I wonder how big it actually is in real life. But these bags are pretty awesome. I know I might be the minority with this kind of opinion. And most of you probably watching and listening to this thinking, what the hell is this guy talking about? Buying a £2,000 DJ bag. That's absolutely insane. But this is where we're at as a culture right now. This is where we're at. I'm considering getting one of these where I can fit my books in there, put, a, put, put some headphones in, a couple of good USB sticks. And there you go, off to the race so everyone can see what you're on. 
because I remember I was playing somewhere recently or maybe at the most recent place I played at and one of the guys that played after me came through and he had one of those kind of cool diesel bags that everyone's wearing at the moment um that the diesel bags obviously that are designed under flipping uh glenn martin's tenure at flipping diesel and it looked really cool he, that was his sword dj bag he had his headphones and his usb inside there and i thought that looked really amazing so i'm have to do the same thing going forward with this sort of stuff maybe 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 i'll keep an eye out for it regardless and you know maybe you might see me in the booth with a two thousand pound villa jugger bag waiting to play i mean waiting for fred again and bless madonna to finish their sets <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ. But anyway, let's continue on with that one. I want to quickly touch up on this because this is something that's quite hilarious. So this is a post courtesy of Adam Port, um, one third of Kind of Music, and somebody that I kind of rate in terms of his artistry, um, in terms of his kind of, you know, remix ability, his remix ability in terms of being a producer and shit, and also in terms of him being a DJ as well, to, to be honest. I'm kind of a big fan of his, and also because I'm familiar with him because he used to post on Super Future back in the day when I used to post on there. And I think at the time, I don't know if he was still pursuing DJing back then or if it's something that happened, you know, many years after, but I do remember him from posting on Super Future. So when I eventually did see him become this big global DJ, it was quite Quite funny be like oh shit i remember this guy he used to post on the same forum that i was on but again I, at that time i had no idea that he did because i guess he probably maybe kept it separate or secret i'm not really too sure but he posted this thing on his instagram account that i thought was incredibly cringe and again i'm a fan of him i'm a fan of kind of music i'm a fan of what they do but this is legitimately one of the most embarrassing and i'd say highly caucasian videos i've seen in a very very long time and this is adam port playing at some venue and for some reason he decides to use this occasion as a instance to basically remind the audience that he's a bad man and also kind of give them an education on what rewinds are right? <laughs> which is flipping insane and yeah let's click the video this is this one here right um and let's hopefully have the sound on so it's what you'd expect from adam port to be playing right it's like a tribal melodic house type of tune something you would hear from a black coffee set something that's kind of ama piano adjacent deep house tribal house whatever it's called melodic house bloody blah, blah whatever those guys play you would kind of ascribe it to it and he's playing this stuff at some amazing venue which is called pont alexander the third it looks fucking amazing they've you know decorated it well cool installations and artworks and leds and lights people are going crazy there's phones out they're having a good time he's playing he's shucking out behind the booth and dancing and doing his thing right doing his little white boy skank and then he's playing and guess what happens And the, so he pulls, he rewinds it back, right? Because he's clearly feeling the vibe. He likes a tune. Maybe it's a tune that's going to come out soon. Maybe it's something that he's remixed. Maybe something that he's produced. Maybe something he's just excited about. But it's just hilarious, the caption. The caption is what really sets it off. Adam Port writes as follows. Please don't be confused if you hear some rewinds on the up and coming shows. I'm a dance horse selector deep, deep in my heart with the Jamaican flag emoji and a green fucking heart emoji next to it. Like, can you get more cringy than that? Can you get more cringy than that? Somehow Adam Paul is trying to convince us that he is this undercover secret dancehall DJ. You know, he was out there flipping. <laughs> playing what? I don't know where, what was he brought up? Was it somewhere in Germany? I'm, I'm assuming, right, maybe? So somewhere in Germany, he was playing, you know, he was on the lineup, you know, playing flipping bashment or playing dancehall sets and whatnot and seven inches at these places. And then somehow he developed into playing a guy that's playing like melodic house and a flipping, what you call it? Um, a Burning Man or something. We, you know, we don't believe you. But even if it is true, why are you telling us this? And why are you explaining it to people in this really weird patronizing way it's really 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 gross and really really funny and i have a real big kind of pet peeve with djs who describe themselves as fucking selectors do you know what i mean like get over yourself a selector like really like that's the stuff that's the kind of language that people like red bull and stuff use when they want to make it seem a lot more in you know i don't know technical and whatever else than it really is then you just playing other people's music and pressing q and pause and trying to blend them in and whatnot it's absolutely ridiculous but to be fair to him 
if you watch the video again and you hear it, there is an audible gasp when he pulls the song back. This audience is incredibly white. They have no idea what a rewind is. And to be honest as well, to be fair to the audience and put it back the blame on Adam Paul, when you technic- when you typically rewind a track, and I know it mostly from grime, that's something that I kind of grew up listening to for the majority of my life, right, in London. Um, you know, I had some of the best stations located around me in terms of pirate stations I was listening to growing up and whatnot. And the whole point of a rewind was a crescendo. It was like a peak moment or it was like when you dropped like a flipping dub play or you dropped like this really banging track that everyone's looking forward to listening to that's when you kind of wheel it back like people were just kind of like literally going to explode out of their skin if you didn't wheel it back one more time and sometimes the song will be so good you'd wheel it back 17 million times i think a, a really obvious kind of pop culture reference um for like a rewind would be that time during the flipping Watch the Front tour with Jay-Z and, and Kanye, where they played Niggas in Paris for the first time in Paris, I think, and they rewind it back like nine times or some shit. That obviously was very apt to where they were. And imagine the first rewind after hearing re- Niggas in Paris playing over that sound system in fucking Paris. So that kind of grabbed the crowd. But just playing this sort of like 120, 118 BPM melodic house stuff and then doing your little shocky dance and then rewind. It doesn't necessarily hit the same. It's got to be something a little bit harder. It's got to be something a little bit faster. And it's not got to be like slow as that. Do you know what I mean? And it wasn't even, it didn't feel like anything. Do you know what I mean? It just felt like it was kind of just doing it for the sake of doing it. And then, you know, telling people, you know, kind of like in a patronizing daddy way with your finger wagging, don't be worried, don't be confused. It's really hilarious. But let's play it one more time. Now white cars are like, ah, oh, they have no idea what's going on. And also, when you're gonna when you're gonna start the tune again, maybe just you know hit the Q button a few times, build up some build up some fucking anticipation. I'm a nobody, and I know that maybe could add to the uh, the allure and to the kind of vibe of the night. Maybe who knows? Then the next slide is even more hilarious because you get to see the people actually behind him up close as it's happening. Look how confused they are. I don't know what's going on. Like, is it over? I thought it was finishing at 4 a.m. <laughs> and I'm wondering also, this sort of like attitude in general, it's not only specific to Adam Paul, it happens to a lot of DJs. I wonder if this is something that just is bound to happen to you when you become successful. Because I know for myself, you know, my kind of goal overall is to kind of get to a point where I'm playing 50 to 70 shows per year right at some of the best places around the world and again that's not crazy amount but that's something that i feel will fit me with the stuff that i want to do in terms of podcasting in terms of youtube in terms of all the other stuff that i want to get up to i also wanted to you know dj to be a kind of an arm an extension of things that i do but not be my whole personality as much as i love it or the only thing that i do but i wonder when that eventually happens for me will i turn into something like this also will i be kind of telling off my my fans and my you know my supporters and kind of doing this kind of weird patronizing condescending thing online and making it seem like i'm so much cooler and shit will i do that also when in theory i'm doing one of the most easiest jobs in the music industry that you could ever have especially if you're a performer because you all you do is play other people's music so it's not ever that serious but there is something about becoming a professional maybe it's because you have to kind of tell yourself your your professional to kind of justify that. I don't know what it is I'm try, trying to think out loud there, there must be something about becoming an actual legit touring DJ who plays in some of the best places in the world and who's kind of revered and has fans and whatnot that it kind of turns you into this person because I don't believe you're just you are that person straight away I think getting behind that booth getting behind those decks having people stare at you having people shout your name having people dm you for guest lists and shit all that kind of weird value that they're kind of giving you people you know if you're a hot girl people wanting to take you out for dinner and stuff and offering you gifts and wanting to fly you out to places just because you flip and play music it can maybe get a little bit weird to kind of get your head around and you can sometimes maybe start to believe how you can sometimes maybe believe that your shit doesn't stink and believe the hype that people are giving you and you can maybe kind of get your head in and suddenly you turn into this maniacal monster and then suddenly you're flipping Charlotte the Wit calling flipping you know um, guys who sit in their bedroom and make tunes nerds <laughs> do you know what I mean that's basically what it can end up turning into I think I'm not too sure but 
I saw that post and I was like, God almighty, the cringe is super high. But again, I've been following kind of music for a while. Um, it's kind of cool to see how big they've become over the last few years. Um, they've definitely gone, I'd say, I won't say mainstream, but they've become a lot more popular than they were when I was first following them. And it's just cool to see that they've kind of grown what I sort of maybe saw as just a SoundCloud with cool flyers for their radio mixes into a fully fledged operation. And I also like the fact that they're all still friends. You know, because sometimes, you know, these things happen and you kind of grow up and so you kind of get bigger and you become more successful and then suddenly people start wanting to leave and do their own thing or they basically fall out. I like that they're also friends. I like that they all have a distinctive style. I like that, you know, again, Adam, for the, what I know is basically straight edge and, you know, wears it with pride and the other guys I don't think are. Like, there's a good mix of personalities and people in an interest group. It's quite cool. And it's also nice that every person has their own little kind of, pool it's not like if you don't book adam there's no point of booking anybody else they all have a kind of pool that you'd want especially if you want to you know play that kind of sound from and me to rampa they all kind of got their own little thing so this is not something to hate at them it's just i don't know i just see that and i just i can't not cringe i can't not feel embarrassed for you for writing that you know what i mean don't be confused please if you hear rewinds on the up coming shows i'm a dancehall selector fucking hell deep deep in my heart and it's funny you're playing that kind of music which is tribal which is generally associated with Africa and you've got the fucking Jamaican flag there. What does Jamaica have to do with tribal music? Absolutely hilarious. But hey, I guess you gotta do what you gotta do when you're the the main guy on the scene in it. You gotta do what you gotta do. Moving on from that, I want to quickly touch upon this. Touch upon this, touch upon this, touch upon this. The Kanye documentary called Last Week that he put out on his channel, which is fast approaching 1 million views already, which is absolutely insane, right? For a little 30 minute vlog that he put out. But I want to say flat out that this documentary is absolutely sick. And I get why people are so excited by it. I get why people have been watching it again and again. I get why people have been watching it and studying it and pulling out screen grabs and stuff and going crazy over it. I understand, I understand, I understand. This documentary is amazing. It really, truly is amazing because what it shows is, especially for a fan of Kanye, especially when you go to the beginning and you got this flipping amazing um, real life um, kind of GTA type game thing that they have going on, right? The first thing that it kind of shows, I think when you check this thing out is that Kanye is actually a good dude and he's actually really good at what he does he's actually really good at delegating he's actually really good at kind of being a leader being a businessman being a creative and generally just being an all-round decent human being and I think what this goes to show really in general weirdly enough is that it kind of shows um, Kanye to up a little bit because it proves that he can be a good dude he can be cool but he just chooses to be a prick because this is pretty cool. Like you can't imagine somebody acting the way that Kanye has the last week or so 24 seven and also running a business. It's not, it can't happen. So clearly he has that punch on of doing that kind of stuff when he wants to, but most of the time he's just cool. And most of the time people that actually deal with him day to day, they get to see this side of Kanye, the one that produces this sort of stuff and put this sort of stuff together. So you've got this really cool game um, with the person wearing all the Yeezy, with the character in the co computer game wearing the Yeezy Gap engineered by Balenciaga stuff. And then the rest of the stuff is just clips um, of basically Kanye throughout that previous week when he was going wild on the flipping internet and whatnot, riding around a car connecting business, doing what he did. Which is funny because I think everybody else online kind of thought when he was ranting and raving online that he was just sitting on his phone not doing anything. But at the time that he was ranting and raving, he was in the process of buying out a manufacturer of like what pullover hoodies or sweats or something, whatever they make. Um, he was having, you know, meetings with the Adidas executives. That was really fucking hilarious and incredible. Like, I think that's the one moment that everyone kind of is talking about where this is a meeting that kind of led to the freak out of Adidas where essentially in this screen, um, he is in a meeting room with Adidas executives and he stands up and starts to play porn on his phone. And he basically says to one of the guys in the, in the meeting, this guy sounds like you. And he just keeps pointing to it and it's full on porn on his phone. And he's playing it and he keeps putting it towards his ear. Listen, listen, this guy sounds like you're in it. And it's clearly a power play, right? It's clearly there to kind of, 
demonstrate that he is the main guy in this room and that he's the one kind of setting the pace and clearly they kind of all kind of indulge him until one of the guys who's kind of really put into it is like no no just chill out man relax relax and then they kind of get to talking but it's a really hilarious point because it's funny to see like executives that would you know if you were to adidas um these executives walking into your store walking on your level on your floor, walking into your studio, coming to visit you, whatever on, whatever it may be. Any of these executives come, you're all shaking. But Kanye is such a big dog, he makes those guys that would make store assistants shake, shake all the time by flipping playing or blasting flipping, you know, German Pornhub stuff on his ear. It's absolutely hilarious, right? And then you see all the cool stuff of him obviously arguing and debating with them. And then I guess the other thing that I really liked about this was whoever the right-hand man was, there's a right hand man that Kanye deals with who I guess sounds like or looks like the lawyer or the accountant or maybe the business part. I'm not really too sure what his actual title is, but it's cool because they're clearly very different in how they approach business. They're clearly very different on how they look in terms of their kind of, you know, flipping the way they put themselves together and whatnot. But I like the fact that he rides for Kanye really hard and he's able to kind of translate Kanye's thoughts without even Tim telling anything in I would say business terms, it may be layman's terms, it may be reasonable terms and not so super bombastic about, you know, I'm the greatest person since Warhol, blah, 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 blah. He's able to kind of dilute, he's able to kind of translate it to make it sound a bit better and a little bit more palatable for somebody that's in kind of, you know, a middle, mid-level executive and whatnot. And then of course we see him tinkering with certain things in the studio itself, talking about design, talking about the things that he wants to do, this bag, this um, seat that turns into a bag thing was really cool, this concept idea. So it's a thing that you could kind of use to kind of carry your stuff in, but it also could, could double up as an actual kind of modular um, or mobile sort of piece of furniture that you could use to kind of carry around to sit anywhere. Him just doing some little styling hits and having an archive of images on his phone that he uses to design stuff with. It was all really cool to see, I'm not going to lie. And I also like the fact that I saw stuff like this, which is just somebody essentially taking a picture of an item that maybe somebody even made, and then I guess prototyping it on Photoshop or Illustrator by having another layer of an of an image that they want to put over top of it. Maybe this is a, a uh, maybe this is a pattern that's going to be stitched on. Maybe it's a maybe it's a color that's going to be added, a panel, whatever it may be. It's just cool to see that the same process that I use to kind of design my flyers or to put together little line sheets is the same thing somebody that's designing at Easy is using too. It's always cool to see that. I think that that's more so my university mindset. I remember when I was in uni at St. Martin's, one of the things that you'd always like to see is like just to see somebody you looked up to doing the same thing that you're doing, right? Or maybe get an insight into how to do that thing in a kind of student kind of way by looking at documentaries and whatnot. So seeing all this sort of stuff really kind of works for me and gets me really pumped up. But like I said, the sad thing about it is that this goes to prove that Kanye, when he's being a dick, he's being a dick because he wants to be a dick because clearly in his everyday life to run a business that's generating the amount of income it's generating, the amount of noise it's generating, how it's affecting culture, you can't be a dick here 24-7. You have to be a good business person. You have to be a good leader in some respects. You have to be innovative in some respects and that requires you to be clear-minded and also that doesn't, I guess, in my opinion anyway, that doesn't mean that that person is going to be suffering from mental health issues um, all the time because you won't be able to perform or operate at that level. I just don't believe that's true. So it kind of puts that to bed. But the really sad and heartbreaking part of it is definitely the end where he goes to go and watch um, one of his daughters uh, play basketball. And they kind of look at it. When you see it at first, it's kind of like a perfect co-parenting type of vibe at first but then the more the kind of video progresses you basically get to see that it's Kanye there on his home is on his Kanye there on his own to see his daughter and not Kanye there with his family to see his daughter play football if you get what I mean so play basketball it's definitely him on his own and then there's a real heartbreaking bit at the end with no music no nothing where he kind of basically walks out of the auditorium on his own he kind of know I think the, the, the shot that's really cool about this is like yeah there it is there's a shot with Kim there as well and again the funny thing as well you can see they don't like each other at all in the slightest they don't even they don't even like glance at each other like they just ignore each other eye wise they're kind of talking at each other through the kids 
they're not talking to each other at all. It's kind of fucking freaky to see. So clearly the relationship has come to a screeching halt. They don't even talk, they don't even communicate in a nice way, maybe through text, but not in person. Or not that we've seen here in person. But it starts off looking quite cool, them being a family together. And then as it progresses, as they leave in the kind of basketball court auditorium and kind of is getting led out and stuff or talking to other people, he's clearly on his own, like by himself, waiting for his car to come, no one else around. And that's the kind of heartbreaking part about it of like what it actually requires to be a creative at his level what it actually the things you have to sacrifice and give up when you want to actually share your opinion especially if it's controversial hot takes and whatnot um that he's effectively on his own all his cool trendy friends that want to be associated with him because he's bad for business his family's obviously had enough of him because they had to deal with him 24 7 and it's just basically him outside in his own or on his phone conducting deals conducting business but you know the, the thing that he wants the most his family is basically fractured but it's a really good documentary regardless like it's really really good maybe i'm kind of pulling too much from from it and I'm over analyzing it and whatnot but that aside if you're a creative and you kind of want to see um, the behind the scenes of Kanye and what he does because you don't really see that too much really um, he doesn't really upload a lot of that kind of background stuff he did it before on his, on his Twitter right in 2018 I think he did take a lot of pictures of his you know studio and you saw loads of Yeezys sorry Yeezys that were being kind of developed and colorways that are being worked on but him kind of like you know vlogging and showing us his day to day and how he conducts business you don't get to see it too tough so to see this is pretty special so I was definitely I was definitely excited when I saw this kind of put out and hopefully we'll see some or more maybe he'll do uh, last last week yeah you know i mean kind of thing coming up here and there on his channel but it's already fast approaching a million views already bro it's on 999 views or some of the comments saying here so he had mad respect for hoodie sales guy salesman he was on his a game kind of the only artist who can drop four minute long video game recreation followed by a 26 million long vlog and a tiny circle and have no one question it channel this energy into the a album so clearly people are loving the documentary as much as i did also so definitely check it out if you haven't already so I went to talk about this actually. This is what I went to kind of end the show on. So this is a segment on outtake from an interview that Kanye did with Tucker Carlson on Fox News that I'm sure a lot of you have kind of already seen or heard about. And I guess Vice somehow managed to acquire or get their hands on some of the outtakes from that interview where he basically went off on one and said some maybe what people would deem to be quote unquote crazy things. And in this particular snippet, he speaks about his relationship with Virgil and how his death affected him and whatnot. And I think this might be the first time we've actually heard Kanye speak at length about Virgil in any kind of way. Because one thing that really, I guess, as a fan of Virgil and as somebody who kind of had the opportunity to work with him for a very, very short period of time in my previous workplace and somebody who was really kind of you know weirdly affected by his passing even though again like i said i didn't know him that well not not well enough to be upset by someone's passing but i guess because i kind of was somebody that sort of like looked up to him and kind of found him really inspiring and motivating and aspirational in terms of the stuff that he was doing um from afar it was kind of it kind of felt like it was a personal loss because i kind of was you know, a friend of his from afar, right? Do you know what I mean? I kind of had this uh, parasocial relationship with the dude because I was always on his Instagram and whatnot. So it was always weird to me when he did pass that you didn't really hear anything from Kanye about it. Like he didn't really speak publicly about it or tri pay tribute to the guy. There were some passing comments here and there, but considering what Virgil meant to Kanye and what Kanye meant to Virgil, you just didn't, you didn't feel like that was the appropriate way to maybe honor your friend i don't know maybe it's not me to say that because it's their friendship but it just felt weird at the time why it didn't happen then of course many years progress and then you know kanye and tremaine have that argument and tremaine basically airs out and says what he says about kanye not being invited to the funeral and then suddenly things start to kind of make sense about the you know the friction that they had maybe because of the louis vuitton job or just because of the industry stuff whatever it may be it maybe led me to believe that maybe they weren't always on the best of terms anyway so whatever kind of impression that they kind of gave to the world or the fact that virgil basically was always kind of very politically correct and didn't really say anything out loud maybe led us to believe things and maybe fill in the blanks that weren't really there but really behind the scenes they weren't really as cool as they probably uh, made it seem but I thought Kanye's comments about Virgil here were really interesting overall. Um, some of them a little bit disrespectful um, and not really something that you'd want to say when you're trying to honor your friend's legacy. But again, I think just to kind of gain some insight into what's kind of really going on behind the scenes with these people, because I, you know, it's all it's it's definitely been 
eye-opening for me these last weeks to kind of see that nothing has really changed in the scene i kind of took a step back actively from being a participant in it and kind of just viewed it as a customer and as a fan from afar but it's it's kind of weird to see that nothing has really changed everyone's kind of the same people are stabbing each other in the back um people are holding secrets over people and you know and if you do do something they don't like they're going to air you out people are smashing each other's flipping boyfriends and girlfriends and stuff behind each other's backs people are jealous of people because of jobs that they got they're bad minding you they're doing this it's all all the stuff that i knew was happening but it's kind of we are wild to see it at that level right i was doing it, it was, i see it in my kind of lowly level at my sort of like protein studios level but it's mad to see it happening at this level right at the kind of lvmh flipping you know paris fashion week um kardashian kanye level that's probably nuts to see but this is anyways a video a clip um kanye on virgil um an outtake from the tucker carlson interview that i'm going to play now at the end of the day we all know we have to answer to god now some of us in desperate times may grab a little bit too much of the hennessy i'll be specific arno shout out Thank you for making the Hennessy, it's delicious. That's, that's an LVMH company. I'm kind of very much so in, in beefing with them right now because they killed my best friend, Virgil. Uh, How did they kill Virgil? They, first of all, they hired him. Um, well, do you want the, uh, you want the, I'm gonna try to like give you the abbreviated story? Yeah. Okay, so, Virgil was hired as my assistant, and he ended up becoming one of my best friends because we traveled everywhere. We traveled to Japan, we interned in Italy at Fendi because we weren't accepted in Paris, and we started to gain momentum in the design world, and then Virgil did his own line called Off-White, uh, and then I stopped doing the Kanye West line, I started doing the Yeezy line, and I did a, a licensing deal. I had a licensing deal with, um, with um, Adidas. I mean, we still have that deal. And we did this fashion show that was the, um, the, it was like the most seen fashion show in history. So Bernardo Noe, the head of LVMH, asked to meet with me. And he offered me a deal but with the deal, they had to have ownership because they're colonizers. Uh, they, they're not there to just, hey, we're gonna give you support and you, know, you do the best thing you can. They, all, the, all these people, a lot of the VCs and a lot of these kind of companies, they have to have ownership. And Louis Vuitton have presented themselves in such a way to have so much real estate where a black man's dream come true would be to have that level of support from a company because then we can go back into the neighborhood in our pink Cadillac metaphorically yeah now the pink Cadillac was literally invented for that do like Google that I don't spill we don't have enough time to talk about it right here the um, the Cadillac that specifically color pink is just like so um, all of my design team wanted to work with Louis Vuitton so Bernard Arnault shook my hand said we're gonna do the Kanye West deal at Louis Vuitton and I was actually gonna give him the lion's share which God thank God I didn't Three months later, they dropped the deal at the board. The next collection uh, I do, season two, we don't have anyone to support it because I had to have Adidas indemnify the collection. The third collection, we're there. Uh, Virgil's working with me. He's got his line, but he's my main employee, and he's um, running the Donda uh, design group and he's bringing in Heron Preston and Matt Williams is working with me and we have our, our crew um, and we do this show at MSG and it's like a big hit uh, season four I uh, I did a show and it started late and I was really depressed about that then a week later Kim got robbed in Paris then I, I just tell Scooter after I finish this like Scooter Braun was my manager at that time. I said, after I finish this leg of the tour, I need to, uh, I need to, I need to just take a rest. I need to go to Japan. I love it in Japan. And they, um, Scooter's like, no, you have to do more touring. And four days into that tour, I was exhausted. 
I screamed from stage. I would have voted for Trump. This stuff. I was like, it's also from everything at that time. Like the fashion show, my wife getting robbed, all these people telling me I couldn't say anything about Trump. Uh, it was just a lot, and I ended up in the hospital. And I just to, just to pause it there quickly. I find it interesting how the question was about Virgil and why he thinks. LVMH are the cause of his death which is an absolute insane you know claim to put out there but it is what it is and he spends the entire time just talking about himself talking about his career talking about his struggles talking about his tri tribulations talking about you know the things he has to overcome talking about his inspirations what all this sort of stuff and it's like this is maybe the perfect kind of summation of maybe what's wrong with modern day Kanye he's unable to kind of take a step back and see things for how they actually are. Because in this story, he's, he's the victim, but he's also the victor, which is really strange. He kind of does that thing that the Kardashians do a lot of times, right? where they want to be looked at as these kind of like, um, what they call them again? They want to be looked at as these, uh, as these girl bosses, right? Like they work hard, they work out a lot, they, 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 their diet's on point. They're always in the office, on their laptop, answering emails, going to the factory and doing this and doing that and doing whatever it may be. But then you also can't comment on their appearance because they're victims, because they're, you know, they're women and because, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover, all this sort of nonsense. So they want to be the, the bosses of all bosses, but then they also want to be able to pull out or to stand behind the victim narrative because it suits their needs. And Kanye is the same thing. He's the kind of reincarnation of every great artist that's ever lived. But on the other part as well, he's also being controlled by these kind of invisible forces that are kind of trying to push him to the brink of suicide or something. You can't be a bully and a victim at the same time. You kind of have to choose one. And for him, he just kind of keeps dancing between the both of the things at the same time. And again, this question was about Virgil. You know what I mean? Why do you think LVMH drove Virgil to death? And he hasn't really been able to explain it. He's, if anything, he's explaining why LVMH might be responsible for him if he ends up passing away, God forbid. But Jeremy, you know I mean? he's not really explaining the Virgil thing. And why I bring this up is because as a Kanye fan, and as a real big fan of Virgil too, and their friendship and their whole extended teams, the Matthew Williams, the Heron Preston, the Justin Saunders obviously got drowned. Tremaine is also part of that group. I, I like what they did right as a team. I think it was pretty amazing to see out from afar. It was cool to see somebody like Virgil being announced as the flipping mentor director of flipping Louis Vuitton. I remember watching and reading that news for the first time, seeing that video interview with him and Naomi Campbell, where he's still trying to process that whole thing, seeing his first Instagram stories where he was going to the flipping Louis Vuitton offices and going up in that lift and taking pictures of himself and playing around in the studio and, you know, setting up the decks and stuff and seeing all the old Mark Jacobs shit in there all that stuff was super inspiring and again it's never really ever been a question to me about the quality of the clothes it's always more so about the person they're doing it looks like you has come from the same scene as you has got a loads of friends in common as you is also doing this amazing thing so it can only it can only inspire you it can only make you feel optimistic about the future that oh if i work hard in the thing that i'm doing i can maybe achieve a level of greatness a level of achievement that i could never ever envision before and it's all because somebody's gave you a little sprinkle of inspiration so when terrain came out with that claim that Kanye wasn't invited to the private funeral, which we didn't knew about, right? It was only something they knew about behind the scenes. It was never shared with us, with anybody, of, with the fans or anything. So when we found out that Virgil's supposed best friend wasn't invited to his private funeral and also wasn't allowed to talk at the public funeral, it kind of made you think, whoa, what the flip is going on? Because usually in funerals, when stuff like that happens, other family members or close friends will step in and say, hey, I know you, you guys fell out, but honestly, we need to honour this guy's wishes or honour this girl's wishes. Let's let the person speak. But I guess at the time of his death, they were not on good terms at all to the point where the family were like, no, nah, you're not speaking, which is flipping crazy. So that that kind of claim still hasn't, I don't think, correctly been answered. And if anything, that basically, his lack of answer basically proves that you know, Kanye is like a terrible person. He's maybe a great artist and stuff, but as a friend and anything else personable, he's, or anything that involves a personal relationship, he might be the worst. He legitimately might be the worst because he still hasn't explained to us why he thinks that LVMH has killed him. I wear that badge. Every conversation I can be 
you know, put down for that. Oh, and also, last point. He keeps talking about this thing about OVMH or about um, uh, Bernard Arnault shaking his head and saying, hey, I'm going to give you this licensing deal. I'm going to put money behind your brand or whatever it may be. Why does he not think that they just maybe decided to just change direction because they just felt maybe Kanye wasn't brand aligned or maybe they felt like he might have another freak out and kind of put them into a sticky position? Or maybe, um, you know, things in the business just change. Why does it, it always have to be some big conspiracy? That's what I don't understand. And then also he kind of fails to link or to basically think about what happened in those three months because he says oh he, he he shook hands with bernardo no here i'm going to do this deal with you and then three months later the deal got killed at the board level when they went to approve it but he never mentions what happened in those three month period did he have a freak out was he involved in some public spat that would have put his name into you know in the mud and whatnot what happened in those three months i'm sure that would have affected these really prim proper you know parisian dudes who are behind kind of making those big decisions at flipping lvmh you'd imagine so right or whoever these executives are but he doesn't really think about that in the slightest very very strange so virgil is going on and you know being more and more successful and clicking all the dots all the boxes that a black designer a black creative should click more than anyone ever he's basically like michael jordan you know he is the michael jordan of fashion literally uh, he's clicking all of these dots and he gets the deal to be the head of men's design at Louis Vuitton, which is, you know, aside from Hermes, is one of the most prestigious jobs in the world. And he goes in and the prop. Do you think, do you think Kanye was always kind of envious that Virgil was able to play the game more than him? Do you think so? Because Virgil clearly was able to play the game. Like, you look at it as an example, like that famous video clip of Virgil and uh, I think it's Colette signing stuff and then ASAP Bari and Ian Connor and few of us London fighting behind him, literally fighting. And he's still signing stuff. It's like maybe the clearest example of just him being about his business. You know, being professional, always turning up, always, you know, always attending, always showing up, always being accessible, always doing the work, blah, 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 blah. And he was just able to maneuver a little bit easier in the corporate environment or in that kind of brand environment with other professionals. And for whatever reason, Kanye just can't do it. He wants to work with these people. He wants them to help him in manufacturing. Once he gets into deals with them, he quickly realizes that it's just not for him. Everything in his body just starts to shake and then he goes on these crazy tirades in an effort to get people far away from him so he can kind of be on his own again. I wonder if that's the thing. So he might be both envious that Virgil could do it and also pissed off at himself that he can't do it product is selling uh virgil was the, actually the third person to die of cancer in that organization uh so not just black men have passed in that organization uh but the third person to die of cancer that was in a higher up position in that organization basically trying to ascribe conspiracy theories to your friend passing away is that just a form of grief is that him basically coming to, is that one of the stages of grief that he's kind of currently on, this kind of weird conspiracy theory thing that he's going through, that he still hasn't maybe accepted the fact that his friend was just, it's unfortunate, the passing, and also he wasted maybe a lot of time not maybe making up with him and making things right before he passed. Maybe that's something. Because that's such a bizarre thing to do. Yes, your friend, isn't it? Like, why are you ascribing flipping conspiracy theories? Like, huh? And with... Paris is a different level of elitism and racism. And Virgil was the kind of guy that uh, he didn't hold it in. And I believe it ate him up from inside. And How old was he? 40, early 40s. Huh. Uh, <laughs> and they were like, what you mean you were his best friend? You don't know the exact age, but I don't know the date. <laughs> You know, he's a young. Well, that is a good point, though. If you are his supposed best friend, you should know what date. You should know how old he is. Maybe you don't know his fucking birthday, but you should know how old he is to the number. You know, like early forties. But again, that goes to showing it just classic narcissism, isn't it? If it doesn't, if it's not about him, it doesn't matter. Young man. Yeah, he's a young man. So, uh, so he um, uh. The level of racism, elitism, and pressure that he was under, I'm sure affected his health. And then at that point, also me and Virgil had a rivalry. 
because he had taken my place in fashion. He now was Drake to the radio of what he was to fashion. And we had a strained relationship also. But the people I've spent the most time with in my life is my mom, second, Kim, third, Virgil. Lost all three of them in, you know, in some way mm. at this point. Um, so. I'm sorry, but having a rivalry with your best friend is just not normal. No matter what anyone says, it's not normal. And I'm assuming it was mostly a rivalry that was born from Kanye's side of things because he was the one that was maybe more cut up and annoyed, which he probably should have have every reason to be because Virgil basically got the his dream job. He called himself the Louis Vuitton Don. He did a pretty decent collaboration with Louis Vuitton the first time around. Probably thought that would be the first step to kind of maybe getting pally pally with them and then they kind of chose another person, his protege, to kind of work with instead. It could maybe be a bit gut-wrenching. It's like them overlooking you and then basically hiring your intern. Not not that deep because Georgia wasn't an intern, but still, you know, I get why he was upset. But that's the kind of thing where you're allowed to be upset maybe for a couple of days, maybe for a week at most. Then you're meant to do everything in your power to support your friend. You're meant to be at the front row. You're meant to be offering to help them, flying people over to help them, lending them their resources. That's what it should really be because may, in the end, if that person wins, you also win because you're their friend, because you exist in the same space. You, you've you got a close bond. When people, people seeing you together, maybe you kind of cement that sort of stuff. So... It didn't, it, it's just something that I don't really ever understand how that can make sense in his head. Like, that was just a normal thing. We should be rivals. And also allowing the industry to kind of play you off each other as well is also kind of weird and lame, especially considering what they had to both go through together at the time because they were both kind of, you know, basically going through the ringer of flipping Paris fashion industry at the same time. So to kind of adopt this kind of like, oh, he's one of them sort of thing, when you know he's not, when you know that's your boy, when you know you've kind of had to share sandwiches and shit and whatnot. That's the gross part of it, I think so. I felt with Bernard know not only did he pull on the deal that contributed to me breaking down uh, and go back on his word with that, um, he also went on to hire multiple people out of my organization. This whole Bernard I know caused me to have a breakdown thing is weird, like victim stuff. Cause you know, one minute he's saying he's the strongest ever mindset wise. I don't have a breakdown, I had a breakthrough. Next minute you're accusing this little scrawny white dude that owns, you know, one of the biggest flashing house conglomerates in the world of like flipping, you know, causing you to go straight to the, causing you to go to the brink of a breakdown is really, really bizarre like strange 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 and then this last point he making about oh they post all my talents like don't you want you hire some of the best people in the industry isn't that maybe like a sign that you have a good eye for talent also like what do you want you want them to stay by your side forever and not make money and stuff and not pr prosper their career like it's very strange and it kind of feels like the type of place where if you did quit depending on what mood he was in he he's one of those bosses to be like yeah i don't ever want to see you here again don't text anyone on the team like you're basically dead to us kind of thing I mean, it's not really ever that serious but anyway that was a whole interview I'm not gonna play any more of it because it's again like i said it's just a bit of a bummer because you know i was quite invested in them as people and as a relationship together from afar and to see what it's kind of you know this devolved into especially post virgil's death has been pretty sad to be honest really bad way to honor his legacy especially on the first anniversary of his fucking passing it's quite horrible but you know what are you gonna do what you gonna do Anyways, that for me is the Axiom Zinger Show number 608. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time tuning into a show, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you would like to come back and visit the channel, of course, you can click subscribe. And if you're watching, you know, if you listen to the video portion, as always, you'll hear a tune of the day to kind of, you know, um, see you out and if you're watching this via youtube it'll just go straight to black but thanks anyway guys i'll see you guys soon peace